you. Anita, thanks for praying for me also. Good morning, everyone. My name is James. I'm one of the members here at Risen King, and Anna and I love this church. We just love being here. It's such a beautiful family and body, and I hope you feel just as welcome as Anna and I have for the last two years that we've been here. Just so at home. We want you to feel at home. And I'm honored to be able to speak from God's Word this morning that we just had read out. And today marks the start of a new series. We're jumping into this letter, 1 John, which is quite short and brief. Let me just make sure I'm timing my sermon so I don't go way too over. Um, It's short and brief, this letter, but it's punchy. There is so much in it that is helpful for us in our daily lives as Christians, but helpful for us as we just come back to the basics Come back to the beginning, which is how these words start. But like all books of the Bible, there's challenging parts. And we'll come to that over this this series and over this time in 1 John. There's difficult parts. And there's also, as per usual and always the way with God's word, there's some life-filled truths for us that I hope are just... um, I hope they move us along as Christians, but also as a family that we come closer together from these words. I'm going to jump into some of those words that we've just had read out. But firstly, when I was teaching scripture, I've taught scripture at a few schools quite a few years back. I remember I'd always come to the class, especially when there are a new bunch of students, and I'd ask them, what would it take for you to believe in God? Like, what is it? Like, just tell me personally, what would, what would it be? These are high school students. And as you can imagine, you always get a bunch of different responses. Someone was like, if a unicorn spoke to you, I was like, whatever, I don't get it. A unicorn's not going to speak. <laughs> but then what happened is they'd, always, they'd come to this same conclusion. Every time I asked this question, they'd say, if God appeared in front of us right now, like if he turned up right now and we could talk to him and we could feel him and... I don't know, maybe then he goes, but if he appeared right before me, I'd believe for the rest of my life. They were so confident in it. And I'd go, okay. Okay, so let's say, let's say God does that. He comes for five minutes, maybe. Is that long enough? And they're like, yeah, that's fine. He comes for five minutes, and you can talk to him, and you can touch him and feel him, and then he goes. Well, what are you going to do then? Are you going to go home and tell your parents, hey, on Tuesday at Hunter's High High School, which is where I was, God appeared for five minutes. Your parents will go, really? Who do I call? But then maybe even, I don't know, how how long are you going to hold on to it? Maybe you have family of your own and then you're telling these kids and you're going, kids or grandkids, I saw God. Tuesday, 25 years ago, I saw God. And I wonder, would they believe you? But what's amazing about this these letters, or this author rather, is he's writing these words almost with that in mind. He even uses the language, dear children, throughout. And he starts by trying to say, I saw God. Not just I, but we saw God. We felt him. We touched him. We spoke to him. We ate with him. We saw him heal. We saw him die. We saw him rise again. Like they're trying to, He's trying to emphasize to us that I saw God. And that this changes everything. He even uses the word still children, as I said. So it's almost like he is talking to his grandkids or talking to his children. And then we get to receive it on the other end. But like Dev read out or mentioned before, he's writing to a people or a church that are in a crisis. They're not individual crises within the body, but like a collective crisis. A crisis where... There's some people which the author uses deceivers who have left the church or at least are now against the church and they're denying Jesus. It's almost like they've forgotten that they saw him or at least that these apostles saw it and they're denying Jesus as Christ and the Son of God. It's almost as if they're saying, ah, I haven't seen Jesus myself. Like, are you really sure God appeared? And so the author comes in and brings this assurance of yes, he did appear. We saw him. And so also, like Dev read out before, the author's rights for this primary purpose, 
to give the readers, the hearers, to give us today assurance. That's it. Assurance of our faith. Assurance of eternal life. He says in chapter 5, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So maybe you agree with you, identify so far with this. So that you may know that you have eternal life. That's why he's written it. That's why it's here before us. And so if you're unsure, maybe you're here today and you're not so familiar with church. And if you're unsure where you stand before God, then these words today and over these series, please keep coming back, they're going to offer a way for you to have confidence in your eternal life when you place your trust in Jesus. And maybe here and you're familiar with church or you're familiar with your relationship with God. That's a part of your daily life. Um, And I want you to feel assured again that because you trust in Jesus, you can have this confidence of eternal life. So I'm going to jump into it. There's four verses. It's quite short and punchy. But I'm going to draw out three main conclusions. Firstly, God appears. Secondly, Jesus restores. And thirdly, we proclaim. God appears, Jesus restores, and we proclaim. That's where I want to go in these four verses. I'm going to pray for us quickly. Father, thank you that this is just, this is central to our time together, that we hear from you, that we come to your word. Father, and I pray that we just never move away from your word, because it's in your word that we can come back to the beginning and have assurance that you lived, that you walked, that you died for us and that you rose again, that there are countless eyewitnesses who saw this happen. Father, I pray today as we look at your word that we are changed and that we love you more and that we want to live a changed life, obeying, listening to you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come with me. If you've got a Bible, let's let's walk through these verses. Verse 1, chapter 1. Of 1 John. The author writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. Straight away he uses that language, that which was from the beginning. This is this is creation language, this is Genesis language. And straight away he's trying to show that God was there at the beginning. This one that's appeared in the flesh was there at the beginning. Jesus even says in John 8, he says, Truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. This is a big statement. The one who came in flesh, came to earth, is claiming to be there in the beginning, at the creation of the world. And that's why I loved Talita's kids talk before and that repetition of like he stepped into a world he's created he's a part of a people that he's created I loved that Talita that was incredible that which was from the beginning he says and we've which we have heard we have seen with our eyes which we have looked at with our hands looked at rather and our hands have touched the author's making it very clear it's most likely John making it very clear that this that Jesus' coming was no creative idea. This wasn't a hallucination that took place or a vision or a dream that happened by one person at one point in time. No, that this was God before us in a man. God was visibly, tangibly before us in the most undeniable of ways. The emphasis is there all the way throughout this whole book, but throughout these words here. Look at what the following verses says. Verse 2, the life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. Come to verse 3. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. There's an emphasis and a repetition to the fact that Jesus physically appeared. The physical appearance of God of this Word of life is the words he used in verse 1, which I'll come back to. But firstly, what does it mean to testify to what you've seen? 
there are millions or countless people out there who are willing to die for something they believe in. It's what's, I'd say, perhaps unique to humanity. But you know what? No one's willing to die for something if they know it's a lie. If they know it's not true, if they know it's a laugh or a stitch up or something, they're not going to die for it. They might go a long way, maybe too far, but they're not going to die for it. But sadly, there's people convinced all around the world and some are willing to die for a religion or a way of life that is based on one person having an epiphany one day and writing it down. And then hundreds of religions and radicals flow from this. Maybe you ask, hang on, isn't Christianity one of those religions? But this author and this letter is written to say, no. Your faith in Christ isn't grounded in some strange dream. Your faith is grounded in the physical appearance of God himself. Who we have seen. Notice the we there, the collective term. We have heard, we have touched, we have looked at with our own eyes. Notice it's not I, but we. There are a number of people, there are a number of apostles who saw, heard, and lived amongst God in the flesh. They saw the presence of God walk by. And let me tell you, church, if if you see the presence of God walk by, there's no way you're going to walk away unchanged. And that's the case for these apostles. Each of them were willing to die for what they not just heard, but what they saw. Something grounded, something real. And they concluded that this one and only holy God-man named Jesus Christ, Jesus the son of Joseph, was worth dying for. It's incredible. Remarkable. And you might think the same. You might think, well, isn't that amazing? The apostles are willing to die for this holy God. But let me tell you, and this is my favorite part. The scandal of the gospel is this. That Jesus appeared and he saw us and thought that they were a people worth dying for. How beautiful is that? Surely one person is going to die for a holy God. But how about a holy God willing to die for us? For people who are so far from holy. Romans 5.8 tells us God demonstrates his own love for us in this While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That was our position. And God said, yes, I will die for them. God sees our wretched heart and says, I want to die for them. He experienced our complete and utter selfishness and says, I want to fellowship with them. He knows the evil thoughts of my mind and still says, I want to spend eternity with him. It is bizarre. It's scandalous. But this is the wonder of Jesus. And this is the wonder that one John is speaking about. Jesus came. God appeared. For what? To die. Why? So as to restore us back to God. Come with me. Point two. Jesus restores. Look at what the author says. Verse one, which we have looked at which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. I love this description of Jesus, the word of life. Why I love it so much is the author could have said, could have said so many things. He could have said the way of life would have been appropriate. He could have said the hope of life or even the light of life. He goes on to talk about Jesus as exactly this. But God chose to speak to his creation through his son. And he chose to have his words embodied in the life of Jesus, who was perfect in word and action. Jesus described as the word of life because Jesus' life was his words. What Jesus said and what he did were never at odds with one another. They were never apart. They're in perfect unity, perfectly unified. He was without hypocrisy. Jesus lived exactly what he preached, exactly. 
So it's only right that we know Jesus is the word of life because his word was his life. But he was also the physical embodiment. He was also the physical presence of God's word. When he spoke to his creation, he chose to put that in a man named Jesus Christ, who was both fully divine and fully human. Anna and I, I'm not sure if you feel the same, but Anna and I have just been up and down with sicknesses. Like it's just been constant. It's, it's having a kid, definitely. Sorry, I don't know why I pointed at you. Not your fault, Anna, but <laughs> we, we did it together. Um, having a kid just means we are almost forever sick. It's crazy. And so this last week was quite up and down, just trying to deal with our poor. And your heart breaks. I was talking to someone before. Your heart breaks when these little ones are sick. Um, but a few weeks back, it would have been a month now, when Anna got sick, her throat was sore, and she lost her voice for about three days. And at first, I just thought, that's funny. Like, it's annoying, but how funny. You don't have a voice for a few days. And I thought, it's not going to be a problem. Like, Anna and I have been together forever, like, which isn't true, for a while in our terms. Um, and I thought, I know what she needs. Like, I know what she wants. She doesn't need to use her words. Like, she just, she just looks at me. I'm like, okay, I got it. I'm on it. <laughs> anyway, there was just one moment um, when Anna was sitting on the couch. I came out. And she looked at me, with, and obviously she voiced this, and she did this action. She went, the mouth open. And I was like, oh, easy, simple. Like, I don't know what you think right now, but I was like, okay, she needs food. That's very clear. <laughs> and so I went straight to the kitchen. I grabbed her of something and felt like an absolute hero and fed her, or at least put the food in front of her. And she continued to stare at me. I was like, what's up, Anna? Like, what's going on? Like, more food? Like, that's quite a lot. <laughs> No, I don't make a comment on that. Um, but then she looked at me, and then she decided to text me, because she was like, this guy obviously doesn't get it. And what Anna was trying to say is, hurry up. Like, would you hurry up? We had to get out pretty soon, and I thought that meant get food. Like, so she was clearly just trying to get me to hurry along, and I realized, you know what, as much as I know her, I didn't know what she wanted. Like, and I need to be humble in that moment and go, I got it wrong. But I wonder if... That's how you feel about God. I wonder if you think you know what God wants. But I want to say to you, unless you're spending time in his word, listening to his voice, sooner or later, or just like me, you'll start to forget what he's saying to you, to his children, to his church. You'll start forgetting what God really wants from us. Church, we are wholly and completely dependent on his word. We meet and know God by his word. That's why he's called the word of life. Because these words aren't merely an expression of an idea, but a reality grounded in the fully obedient physical appearance of God's son, Jesus Christ. That's why we love the word of God here at church. That's why we treasure these words so much. And the minute we move away from these words, then we're listening to a word that's tainted or inconsistent. And most probably, I'll speak for myself, it's my own word. So church, let's treasure his word. Because when we treasure his word, we are saying to God, we treasure his life. We treasure the life of Jesus. Jesus restores us by his word. Now come with me to verse 2. We will keep moving through these verses, don't worry. You know, in verse 2, is that all we're up to? We will keep flicking around. The life appeared, verse 2, and we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life. There it is. Which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We have seen and testify that Jesus is and offers and has made possible to you the eternal life. That's what the author's trying to say. Our confidence of eternity is not based on anything we can do. And for some of you, that's a relief. But it's entirely based on what Jesus did in his life. Because Jesus is the restorer. Not ourselves. He is the one that has made an eternity Possible in a restored relationship with the God, with the creator of the world, possible. It's by his obedience to the Father. 
by his actions unto the death, by his power, can all of those, you and I, who hear his voice, receive eternal life. Look at what Jesus says in John 10, which is possibly my favorite chapter in the Bible. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. This is John 10, 27, if you were heading there. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life. There it is. Jesus said it plain. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. It's a really beautiful promise. But did you hear that? It's Jesus who gives eternal life. It's a gift. We don't earn it. We'll never live a good enough life so as to stand before God and say to him, I've lived it. I've done it. And you, sir, owe me eternal life. That won't be the reality. Jesus restores us back into a right relationship with God for eternity. What a beautiful promise. Come with me to the next verse of 1 John, verse 3. The author writes, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and that our fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus not only restores us to His Word, He not only restores us to eternal life, but He also restores us into fellowship with one another and with God Himself. Fellowship is and means to be united together based on what we've seen and heard. And we as the church come together because Jesus physically met with his people. God physically met with his people. Our fellowship with one another on a day like today is a picture of what God has done in sending Jesus to us. To be together, to be in communion to be in relationship with one another, in fellowship. So church, as we go out to share the hope of Jesus, what we're doing is we're welcoming them. We're welcoming people into a family, into a body of believers, just in the same way Jesus has welcomed us into his kingdom. Jesus says, the world will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. I think that's a powerful, subtle little line of Jesus's where he's trying to say, unless you're together in relationship, in fellowship, in communion, how can the world know that you're mine, that you are disciples of me, that you follow me? How else can we do this but be together? Which brings me to my final point, we proclaim. So we've looked at God appears, we've looked at Jesus restores, and our final point, we proclaim. Did you see the language throughout these four verses? The author says, this we proclaim, verse 1. This we testify and we proclaim, verse 2. Again, he says in verse 3, we proclaim to you. And then he ends this introduction by saying, we write this to make our joy complete. I love that. I think it's easy to overlook, but there is a joy, isn't there, that comes with proclaiming the truth of the gospel. I, um, I became a Christian, I became a Christian down, uh, funny enough, by someone coming up and talking to me down at the skate park as a young teenager, I was about 15 or 16, it's a, yeah, over those few years, and someone came down to the skate park and he was an amazing skater, incredibly nice guy, and I don't know, we got chatting and then he asked me, what do I, have I, what do you ask? He said, do you believe in God, have you heard about Jesus? I was like, oh my gosh, really? <laughs> like, let's skate. But he was actually a really nice guy, and he was good at skating, so that helped. <laughs> but it was through that time that eventually God did a number of things. I met people. I met other Christians. I saw them in fellowship with one another. And it was through a number of questions that he put on my mind that I came to a point of going, oh my gosh, the, the hope a Christian has of eternal life is sure. And I remember that joy I felt when I became a Christian. It was beautiful. It was, um, yeah, disseminated into every part of my life. I couldn't help but go, gosh, 
look at what's happened. Look at how God has changed me. And then a number of years later, maybe five or so years later, I was back down at the skate park, still a Christian. And by this point, a Christian, well, at least I felt, on mission. I thought, okay, if I've been saved, if someone's come to meet me at the skate park and tell me about Jesus, I'm going to go do the same. So I'm down at the skate park, um, skating around, and I met a few people and trying to t- talk to them somewhat you know, intentionally. And I met this guy, Wallace Son Lopez from Brazil. And I struck up a conversation with him and we had a chat and I just, that joy came back. That joy of like, oh my gosh. And we started talking about the gospel and what matters. And I asked him, what are you, what are you living for? What matters for you? And he explained, you say Bra- Brazilian jiu-jitsu was it? And I was like, stay away from me. No. <laughs> But I remember that moment in which the joy came back of just, oh my gosh, here I was, a different skate park, but years earlier, and I'm hearing the gospel, and now here I am getting to proclaim the truth of Jesus to just someone else, someone new, someone different, someone that I didn't really know that well. We'd seen each other just a few times that day. And then... He ended up, I ended up moving in with him and five other Brazilians, and it was a great year. It was strange, but it was a great year. <laughs> but I say that because what I want you to do today, at morning tea, after this, I want you to ask someone, when have you felt joy from proclaiming Jesus? Talk about that today. When have you felt the joy of proclaiming Jesus? Maybe you hear me ask that or suggest that, and you think, ah, I don't feel that. I haven't felt that for a long time. Perhaps there's moments when you feel like it would be easier to just, to just stay quiet about the fact that you're a Christian at work. Or more comfortable to just say nothing when someone asks you how your weekend was and what you got up to. Or perhaps it's just too exhausting to sit and take the time to listen to someone so as to see a gospel conversation possibly come out of it. Sometimes it just doesn't feel that joyful, does it? There's a beautiful psalm where King David cries out to God with a feeling just like this. And he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Perhaps this is your prayer today. Maybe this is what you need to ask God today for a restart a return to the beginning where you just remember that Jesus was born, that he did live, that he walked, that he ate, that he drank, that he healed people, that he died, that he rose again. I want to encourage you to go back to the beginning. Maybe you just need to see Jesus again. Return to the Gospels. There's four incredible accounts of just his life and all that he said and all that he did that were in perfect alignment. Go back there. See the life that he lived and see the death that he died. Because when when Jesus rose from that grave, one of his disciples just simply could not believe it. He could not believe that Jesus had really conquered death. Until a moment when Jesus appears before this disciple, his name's Thomas, and he says to him, Feel my hands. Marks in his hands. He says, feel my hands. Reach out to my side. Stop doubting and believe. That's what Jesus says to this disciple. And Thomas says, my Lord, my God. And then Jesus responds with this little sentence that I think carries so much weight for us today. He says, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. How beautiful is that? Blessed are those who have not seen yet believed. Church, that's us. 1 John is written so that we might be the blessed ones who have not seen yet believe. Those high school kids in that scripture class that I tell you about, They didn't need Jesus to appear before them. What they actually needed was the living, active word of God that tells us God has appeared as God's word. He offers eternal life. He offers fellowship with each other, both now and forevermore, for eternity. 
That's the hope we have in these words. And that's the encouragement we have for us today. Let me pray for us. Lord, would you please restore to us the joy of your salvation, of that moment that you saved me? Remind me of that, God. Of the moment that you sent your son into a world you created to die at the hands of people you created so as to see the very people come to spend eternity with you. Restore to us the eternal assurance and sure hope that we have because you came and dwelt among us. Thank you, Lord, for your life in place of mine. And Father, I ask that our lives be a testament to yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.